just want to be with him tonight. More than the neighbor beside you, more than your family, more than your friends. Just, just to be with him. Well, Shannon, it's life to be with him. It's life to be with him, Brother Josh. That's where I want to be. It's connected to life. I know that we as Christians, we, we have trials. We have things that we go through. But every day is a good day. Every day is a good day. Because all things are working out. Just the way he intended it to work out. It may have been a speed bump that kind of hit us out of, it just maybe, maybe we didn't see it coming, but he did. And the world can't say that everything's working out for their good, but us as Christians can say all things work together for the good to them that love God. All things, no matter what comes, no matter the mountains, no matter the valleys, all things. I'd say Sister Carol Kinzer didn't see this speed bump coming. But we know that the devil would like to sign a death warrant on her, but God has already got it taken control of. He's in control of this, and we want to lift her up in prayer this evening that God would completely touch her. I know that she says that she is at peace, at peace with everything there, but... She just wants to go and be with her husband, Brother Sammy, there. And Brother Sammy, we have so many, so many memories that flood our mind uh, of the meetings. And a lot of us spent time there as, as young people. We spent time at those meetings going with Brother Homer and being a part of those meetings. And they are dear friends to us. And when one part of the body is hurting, all of the body is hurting. And so we just want to take this need tonight. We want to be remembering our pastor, Brother Ron, as he is there speaking just now, they started service there at 5 o'clock their time, which is 6 our time. Our pastor is speaking now and, and is dealing with congestion. And, uh, but we know that God is going to get the message through. Amen. And so we just pray that God would anoint him. Also, the Borlevon family is there with them this weekend there in the meetings. And uh, so we just want to be remembering those things. We want to be remembering these meetings right now. This is a very special time for us to be sitting around the revealed word, and we just want the Son of Man to speak to our hearts tonight. If you have a need, would you like to lift your hand and lift it unto a God that cares and sees? And he sees every sparrow that falls, and He knows your need tonight. Father, we love you tonight, Lord, and what a privilege it is for us, your children, to call upon the God of heaven. Lord, this service has been set aside, Lord, to, to worship you and for you to come and speak to our hearts through your living word. Lord, it's, it's, very, <clears throat> it's very wonderful to be standing here with our brothers, our sisters, our family. But Lord, to be standing with you in this moment, Lord, it's life. Lord, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're still the same yesterday, today, and forever and that you never change. You're a God that heals cancer. We've already seen you do it. Lord, we've already seen you working in our midst here this evening. Lord, testifying that leukemia is defeated. Lord, we're not ashamed to testify of the grace and the mercies and the healing powers of Almighty God. And Lord, we just pray that you would come on the scene for our sister Carol Kinzer. Lord, I pray that the Holy Ghost would envelope her vessel just now and touch her life, oh God. Lord, I pray that you'd work everything out according to your will. Lord, we know that, that you're more than able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Lord, I pray that you would bless the meetings in Louisiana. I pray, God, that you would go after that last seed. You know where it's at. Lord, you, it may be here, it may be in Louisiana, it may be in Canada, but I pray, God, that you would bring that seed to maturity, Father, that we as your children can go home, O oh God, for our desire is to see you face to face. Lord, to commune with you day in, day out, Father, where you are the light of the city, where there is, there is no darkness, for there you are the light. Jesus, sometimes we don't even know what we want. 
Sometimes we don't even know what we need. But you've already prepared a city for us that's so perfect for us. To our liking, oh God. And Lord Jesus, I pray that we would have a life here that would match the character of that city. I pray, God, that you would just move on behalf of these needs tonight. Speak to our hearts tonight through your word. And we'll be careful to serve you. And give you all the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Man, if you have your Bibles, if you will, turn with me to the book of Romans chapter 1 and Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 and Mark chapter 8 and verse 34. I'd like to speak to you tonight on the thought of never ashamed. We, we spoke to you on a couple weeks ago, but... Uh, Brother Alden told me that's how you preach the lights out right there. Yes. We, pre- we preach the power went out. And I tell you what, if, if, if the power goes out tonight while I'm preaching this service, I just say that the devil just don't like me preaching this thought. So um, I uh, didn't come too far to go back now. So. so we'd like to, by the help of the Lord, speak to you on this thought of never ashamed. And as you're reading there in Romans chapter 1 and 16, you remember that Paul here is is addressing the Roman church there at the time. And this is the same Paul that if you would read over in the book of Acts, you will see this Paul as he is tormenting the church of the day. He is known as a destroyer of the church, one that once stood against the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he took pleasure in seeing out his duties as a priest there, as, a, as, his, as the religions of his sect there. He took, he took pleasure in, in, in carrying out these duties. But when he met the pillar of fire in Acts chapter 9, you will see a totally different man that God would change his name from Saul to Paul. And then you'll see here in Romans chapter 1 and 16 that Paul says that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Here is a man, as we've just read this, a man where we look in one part of life where he is, he is so against the church, he's so against the everything that Jesus stands for, but now he is embodying everything that Christ is. And he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Mark chapter 8 and verse 34. And when he had called the people unto himself, unto him when, with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words... In this adulterous and sinful generation of whom, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. May God bless his word. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Never ashamed. There's a lot of things... There's a lot of things in life that we could say about our own walk or our own things, our own, our own life that we could say that we're ashamed about. But I could never identify myself as those that are ashamed of Christ. I see the works of a living God as he's worked out things in your life. How that he would come by and change your, change your walk and change your life completely transforming you by the power of his word I could never be ashamed of that. But today we find that it's a very popular thing to say that, that, that we are, or people say that they're, they're not ashamed to say that they're a part of a certain denomination. 
they're not ashamed. They're not ashamed of that. They're, they're, it's more popular to say that they're a part of a, a denomination more than they are a Christian. You'll hear people say that if you ask them if they're a Christian, they'll say that they're a part of this denomination. I, I seen, I seen a lady a while back at a restaurant, and I seen she was wearing a skirt, and I. I did, I did as the prophet had, had, had done many times. He said he walked up to them and he asked them if they were Christians and they'll say their denomination. So I walked up to this sister and I said, now, I said, I see you're wearing skirts. Are you a believer? She said, well, I go to the, I go to the church of Christ. And that was her immediate response is that she was identified with the church of Christ. And I thought, wow, that's pretty amazing that the church of Christ preaches holiness even now. But but, but here her first words was identifying herself with a denomination. You see, you'll find it, it's very popular today that man wants to be identified with the fatherhood of a church more than being a follower of God's word. They're, they're ashamed to stand with Christ upon his word and so they take an easy road out of just proclaiming their denomination or their creed instead of coming out and standing on Christ's word in which we know that heaven and earth will pass away. But this word will never pass away. I recognize tonight that this building that we're in, if time should last, that this building is going to pass away. I recognize that this vessel that I'm living in, it's, it, life is but a vapor, but I realize that this life can pass away, but there's something packed on the inside of me that can never pass away. It's eternal, just as God is eternal. But I never want to say that I, I've taken an easy road out by just attaching myself to a, a man's thinking, but attaching myself and becoming identified with the word of God is our ambitions as Christians to seek him out, to find what he says about me and you, to find what he's doing in this hour and doing in this life. That's what our key is as Christians, is to find out what he said about you and I. It's important as Christians to know who Jesus is. It's important as Christians to know what Jesus done. But what about you today? What about in your walk? What about in your life? What are you doing? Are you living out this gospel? Now Jesus said, now if you are ashamed of me, then I'll be ashamed of you. Why would he be ashamed of you? Because you're claiming to be his when you won't follow him. What if I said this little boy, he's my son. He turned around and say, who me? Be your son? What do you think I am? It would embarrass me. It would embarrass me if Reagan or Allie and I would say that's my daughter and they turn around and they say, well, me, be your daughter, it would sure embarrass me if they would say those things, me, be your daughter. It would sure embarrass me, but how embarrassing it is for Christ, how that he would say that I'm ashamed of you when men say that they are Christians but do not follow one word of his teachings. You see, they want to be identified with something and still Christianity is still the most popular Christian religion or the most popular religion in the world. They say by statistics that Christianity in the world is over 33% of the world of religions and it's filled of the rest of Muslim and, and Islam and atheists and agnostics. They fill up the rest of the pie chart that they've they come up with. But yet in that Christianity, in that 33%, you can maybe find maybe 1% that is completely full of the Holy Ghost. I hope that doesn't stagger you tonight. But to be filled with the Holy Ghost, the life of this word, is what it's about. Now Jesus said in Luke chapter 12 and 8, Also I say unto you that whosoever shall confess me before men... Him shall the Son of Man confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. And when they bring unto the synagogues and unto the magistrates and powers, Take ye no thought of, or, or how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in that same hour what ye ought to say. 
Now Webster gives us this, uh, the definition of ashamed as we read last time. Embarrassed or guilty because of one actions or characteristics or associations. Reluctant to do something through fear of embarrassment or humiliation. And you find that oftentimes that when men are reluctant to move forward in their Christian walk, it's because that they are ashamed of where they are in their walk. They're ashamed of where they are. They're ashamed of the life that they're living. Or they're ashamed of the process that they'll have to go through to take that leap of faith and step out and walk and live for Jesus and to proclaim the name of Jesus. They're ashamed of that leap of faith that they'll have to take. They're ashamed of it, but I want to tell you tonight that, that if you'll make the first step, if that's you tonight, if you'll make the first step, I promise you that Jesus will make the next. Maybe you're ashamed, maybe you don't know what to say, but the Bible said in that self-same hour, the Holy Ghost will give you that word to say. Is it all right if I just preach to you just a little bit tonight? You know, if you would look at anybody, any man of God's life tonight, if you look at it, if you look at Brother Brandon, look at mine, look at Brother Ron, or look at Brother Homer, if you would look at any man of God's life, I'm sure that you will find that there are mistakes in that person's life. You'll find out real quick that, that men are men. You can look down through my family history and even look through Brother Branham's life and you can find mistakes there. That's the thing to me that what makes this message so real is that Brother Branham was a man. And he was not ashamed to tell that he was a man. He was not pointing us to himself. He was pointing us to Christ. But you can look at Brother Branham's history. Look at his life. You can look at his own humanity. You'll see mistakes there. You'll find failures there. You look at my life you'll, or somebody else's life, a man of God's life, you may have found spots in that person's life where they may have robbed or they may have cheated or, or they may have lied or may have failed or maybe let somebody down. You know, there's actually people that have searched out about the ministry and tried to find things, find out dirt on the ministry about myself, Brother Ron, Brother Donnie Reagan, Brother Tim Pruitt, doing background checks, trying to find faults in our own ministry or in our own lives. Trying to, put a, trying to put a pinpoint on us and say that we got faults. Well, I'll be the first to tell you tonight, you ain't got to look very far and you'll find faults in me. You'll find where there was mistakes. You'll find where I got angry. You'll find where maybe I let my temper go. There's probably some times in my life where I look more like Jesus casting the money changers out the temple more than I look like Jesus dedicating babies. But I'm not ashamed to tell you that I am a man. I know I've let some of you down just now because I know that some of you think I'm a, an angel or, or more than that. But I, I want you to assure you tonight that I'm a man. And you ain't got to look very far in my past to find that I'm a man. You can find faults and you can find mistakes. But let me point you to somebody that ain't got one fault. They ain't got one blemish. They ain't got one mistake. He never lied. He never stole. The only time he ever cheated is when he cheated death. That's the kind of God that I can point you to tonight. I know kingdom builders want to point you to themselves and try to boast up their self and build up their self. I'm not trying to point you to myself or point you to a man, but point you to Christ tonight. I can be ashamed of myself, sure. There's a lot of things in my life that I'm ashamed of or I'm embarrassed of or I'm reluctant to tell you about. But there's not one thing that I'm ashamed to tell you about in Christ's life. I can take you through the scriptures and I can tell you about a God that saves. I can take you through the scriptures and tell you about a God that delivers. I can take you through the scriptures and tell you about a God that raises the dead. I can take you through the scriptures and tell you about a God that still cares. I'm not ashamed to testify that God's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. And it should not embarrass you or make you ashamed to testify that God's still God. Are you with me this evening? 
in the message of shame, the prophet said, I think of the prophets of old when they come with that message and it embarrassed the kings and it made the people feel uncomfortable. The priests, even they would feel uncomfortable because they were supposed to be leaders, religious men. When the word came forth in that manner, it exposed them and they felt embarrassed or ashamed. You know, that's what the word does. When it comes, it comes and it cuts our hearts. It cuts our life. You know, I have, I have never preached a sermon where God didn't come and touch me while I was preaching it. Where God didn't do something and cut something off of my life. Where I find that where I found where I needed what I was preaching. And I'll say this to you if you'd be honest tonight that you'd say that, it, that, that there has never been one service come by your way that the word of God didn't cut you. Cut things off of your life. We look over in the Bible, in Luke chapter 7. You look there and you'll find of a description that we're very familiar with where Jesus is invited to a, a Simon the Pharisee's house. And you find in that scripture that there is a woman of ill fame there that comes into the picture when she spotted Jesus sitting over in the corner being the outcast in that party. And this catches her attention. You see, in the eastern countries, when they would invite you to a party, they would welcome you to that household. They would welcome you in through the doors, and there would be a foot wash plucky there that would wash all the manure and all the stink off of your feet. By walking in those streets where the donkeys and the horses and the goats and everything was, they would wash your feet. And here, when Jesus walks into the house of Simon, they wash, they do not wash his feet. They do not give him any anointment oil. They do not kiss him. You see, in the eastern countries, when they invite you to a party, they would kiss you, the owner would kiss you on the cheek, and he would welcome you into his household. You see, the kiss was what welcomed you into that household. And when the owner or the master kissed you, you were welcome to every spot in the household. You are welcome to the fridge. You are welcome to the icebox. You are welcome to everything in that household. The kiss made you a full brother. But here this woman of ill fame sees Jesus sitting in a corner. A woman that had a very scarred past. A woman that had her life was in disarray. A woman that we would say that she, if we would ask her from this spot, about her history, I'd say that she's probably a little bit embarrassed about her life. Probably a little bit ashamed of where she'd been. But don't ever condemn her. You see, before there was a fallen woman, there was a fallen man that caused that woman to fall. You see, something... Brother Branham said he searched that woman's life out and he said, I looked at it and he said, here she was, maybe some sweetheart. Her sweetheart had crushed her life and sent her on this path. How many of you were maybe trodden down and broken and in a spot of despair when Christ came and met you there? But he never left you where he found you but he brought you up out of the miry clay. I know sometimes as Christians, you get the idea that you're clean and everybody else is dirty. But let me tell you this. If you walk around the world and you think you're something, you're not ever going to win anybody to Christ. If you walk down the road and say, well, they're not going to make it. I highly doubt you ever win one person to Jesus Christ. But I pray as Christians that we would have the attitude, what would Jesus do? More than a bracelet, more than a statement, what would Jesus do? Anything, my goodness. 
What a shame for them to leave, be living in that kind of condition. If it wasn't for grace, you'd be right there. If it was not for grace, I'd have been strung out on trucks. I'd have been laid out in some gutter somewhere. If it was not for grace. But grace came running by my way. And I'm not ashamed to testify or tell anybody I come in contact with. It was grace that put me in my place. Sure, the church world would have never wanted a woman like this in the church. But where was she welcome at? At Jesus' feet. A woman that had done all types of wrong things. Given her body out to the men of that city. But she recognized about a something in a man sitting in a corner that Simon missed. You see, Simon, all he seen was a man where he could get miracles from. Simon wanted the miracles, but he didn't want the word. And that's where you find a lot of people today, you'll even hear TV evangelists or televangelists, however you say it, quoting Brother Branham, speaking Brother Branham's name, but all oh, they'll tell you that he went off at the end. I'd be ashamed to testify of all the supernatural and not testify of the word that came behind it. Does not the word come to the prophet? They say he went off at the end. That's when it got to me. It was not, it was not the first pull that got me. It was not the second pull that got me. But the opening of the word. It was that opening of the word that caught my attention. And I'm not ashamed to tell you tonight, this was more than a man that caught my attention. When the president would come to the city, or any city, you'd hang out. You'd hang out in the streets full of flags. You'd throw flowers out in the street. You'd sing the band down to the depot when he would get off the train and you do everything to make him feel welcome. But Jesus can come to your city and into your home and you'll give him a place in the attic. A little prayer room on the outside, or out in the side or maybe down in the basement. If your company's there, you have nothing to do with him. You'll wait till after a while, maybe. Maybe he's at the house. And you slip up in the attic and shut the door and say a few words to him and come back down ashamed of him. That's the way Simon was. He was ashamed of him. He was ashamed to kiss him. He was ashamed to make him feel welcome. I say full gospel lighthouse, never walk in them doors back there until you make him feel welcome. This is not about you. This is not about how pretty you can sing. This is not about the song leader. This is about Jesus. And if he don't feel welcome here, I'm not welcome here. We sing that song, Consume Me, Lord. Consume me, Lord, with the fire of your spirit. Break me, Lord. If you have to break me, Lord, and use the broken pieces of my life. I want to be used by you. But I really wonder sometimes when you're singing that song, is that really what you want? Is Christ to consume you? You know, when you're singing that song, you could be singing your own testimony right there. You could be singing the truth or you could be singing a lie. I wonder sometimes, do we want him to consume our thinking? Consume our extra time. Consume our energies. Consume our walk. Consume our parenting. Consume our social life. And consume our relationships. If you answered yes, I'd say you're a Christian. If not, come to the altar. Do you really want him in every door of your life? I know I do. But here this woman, here this woman has a wrecked life. A wrecked life. I won't call your name, but you can put your name right there. 
Here this man, Andrew, had a wrecked life. This woman had a wrecked life. The community knew her. The community knew what she had done. And the community looked down upon her career. They looked down upon everything that she was. But now she's in a spot in which the town people think that she's embarrassing herself even more. She's down at Jesus' feet crying and weeping and washing his feet with her tears. Mother Branham said that when she got done, her hair was soaked because she cried so many tears. If you would have looked in her eyes, her eyes were matted up with all the oil that she had done with all of her life, all of her career. She spent everything that she had on the most precious oil to pour it on Jesus. Her eyes were matted up. The oil was all over her mouth and all over her face, bowing down at his feet, washing his feet, kissing the manure off of Jesus' feet. And the rest of the town was thinking, my, she's making herself a fool and embarrassing herself. She has the lowest life in the city, but now here she is even more, embarrassing herself, kissing the feet of this false prophet called Jesus. But Jesus turned to Simon when he perceived their thoughts and said, if he really was a prophet, he would know what type of woman this was. The scripture says that she came behind him and she was washing his feet. And Jesus said, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he begins to give him a parable of which one would love the man that forgave the most. Which one? And he said, the one that forgave, that, he, that the ruler forgave the most, he said, you've rightly judged. He said, this woman has much sin in her life. <sighs> but this woman is going to walk away here completely debt free. Completely sin free. Sure, the church world wouldn't want her in their church, but she was welcome at Jesus' feet. That's why Jesus said, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come. Jesus is still calling. This message of never being ashamed is about exactly what Sister Crystal and Sister Angela did about testifying of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power unto salvation. And if we're too good to testify about Jesus and about what he did for us, I'd say we've got ourselves too high. We think too much about ourselves. I heard Brother Branham say it this week. He said, when you really think you are something, stick your finger in a bucket of water and pull it out and say, that's me. That's me right there. Nothing. When she came to Jesus, I was looking at this scripture today, going over these things. She didn't have an inclination what Jesus would say to her at the end of this account of taking place here. She didn't know what was going to be said, but she did not do it. Because what she thought Jesus would do or what Jesus would say She's seen him as worthy. She's seen that Jesus needed to have the finest oil that there was. She's seen that Jesus' feet needed to be washed. She didn't know that Jesus would turn to her and say, you've embarrassed yourself. You've made yourself a mockery in front of this crowd. But all of thy sins, which are much, be forgiven thee. Oh, hallelujah. She didn't know that he would say that at the end of this account. 
but she did it anyhow. It is my main purpose in life to serve Christ. It is my main purpose in life to praise Christ. I hope you don't mind me talking about myself here for a few moments. But it's my main purpose in life to wake up and worship God. To wake up and pray to God. To wake up and read His Holy Word. It's my main purpose in life to serve Him. But to hear Him say that I'll make you a head and not the tail. That I'll fill your baskets. I'll fill your storehouses. I bless you coming in and I bless you going out. I'll serve Him no matter what. But to hear Him say I'm going to take away all your sin. To me it's just a cherry on top. I get to serve Him and I get the kingdom too. I can hear him say, I forgive you of all of your sins. I'm going to take away all of your sicknesses, all of your afflictions, and all of your diseases. And not only that, I'm going to rapture your earth and soul. What a privilege it is to serve a king. The world wants to tell me that I need to be ashamed of Jesus. The world wants to tell me that I need to be ashamed of this gospel. The world wants to tell people that they can't call themselves men of God and women of God and Christians in this world. They don't want the name Jesus mentioned no more. But they've come too late to try to stop me now. I've been testifying of the marvelous grace of Jesus Christ. For over 12 years now, ever since, he got a hold of my life, and I have no intentions on stopping now. They can try to shut me down. They can try to stop me. But I'll never be ashamed of this gospel and everything it stands for. Hallelujah. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 54. When you look in this scripture, the scripture is speaking of a people who have been through captivity, that's been through wars, been through bondage, been through calamities, they've been through trials. This is a people that have watched their sons and their daughters, their lives be destroyed. This is a people that's outcast. This is a people that's outside their land. This is a people that's a desolate people. This is a people that's been kicked around like a rag doll. Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 1. Sing. Sing. When you read those words, you automatically think about singing for Jesus. But what about when you hear somebody that you're very close to and you hear them singing, what is it testifying to you? They got something to sing about. They're happy. They're full of joy. But to me, it's amazing to watch somebody that's going through a very dark moment and to see them singing. When you're going through moments of despair and moments of trials, I'm watching you. Christ is watching you. And to see you still singing, And to see you still praising God. It shows me that there's joy in your soul. He says, sing, O barren. Thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud. You got something to sing about. Now I don't know what his plans are with this. But he woke me up Thursday morning and he told me to tell you your joy is returning. I 
don't know if he's got plans. I don't know what his plans are to preach a message on that or just to say that to you tonight. But he told me to tell you, your joy is returning. Your joy is returning. Sometimes, sometimes it feels like all hope is gone and there's nothing left for you. But he's got a word for you to tell you that your joy's returning. Your joy's returning back to you. You've gone through Laodicea and Laodicea has stripped you of all of your joy, stripped you of all of your peace. But the word of the Lord says your joy is returning. David cried out in Psalms 51, create in me a clean heart and create a ray, create in me a clean heart and renew in me a right spirit and restore to me the joy of my salvation. Oh, restore the joy of my salvation. It was not saying that David was lost. He had just lost the joy of his salvation. That's what sin will do to you. It will rob you of your joy. It will rob you of your peace. It will rob you of praising God. That's what sin will do. And he cries out, God, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Oh, hallelujah. Maybe you're going through that moment right now. Maybe you're going through a moment of dark despair. You never lost your salvation. You just lost your joy. But your joy is coming back. Your peace is coming back. Your family's coming back. You got something to sing about. For Gospel Lighthouse, we are known for praising God. We're known for our worship. But now you got something to sing about. So my admonition to you is sing like you never sang before. Praise like you never praised before. Worship like you never worshiped before. If God cared enough to wake me up early in the morning to tell me that your joy is returning, I'd say God is as good as his word, that your joy is on its road. Don't wait for it. It's returning. Open the door and let joy come on in. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We got something to sing about. We ain't just beating our hands for no reason. We're not just saying amen for no reason. We got something to clap about. We got something to sing about. We got something to dance about. And I'll never be ashamed of that. I'll never be ashamed of that. Sing, O Barry. Remember who the word was coming to, a people that were desolate, a people that were broke up, a people that were out of their land. Sing, O Barry, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate Then the children of the merry wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent. He's telling you to make ready. Make ready. Scoot over. Stretch out your borders. Search out the land. Enlarge your tent. Get ready. For Gospel Lighthouse, two weeks ago, there was a proclamation testified at this pulpit that this church was going to be blessed and God was going to do extreme things. Enlarge your tents. Make ready. Get ready. Enlarge. 
Let them stretch forth the curtains of thine inhabitations and spare not lengthen the cords. Whew. Strengthen thy stakes. Drive them down farther than you think they need to go. Strengthen your stakes for the blessing that's getting ready to be poured out upon you is going to press it out to the max. Even when I don't see you working, I know that you're working. It don't look like the tent's getting filled. But I want you to know that Abraham, Melchizedek's on his way. Hallelujah. Enlarge the place of thy tent and let, let them stretch forth the curtains of thy habitations. Spare not. Lengthen thy cords and strengthen thy stakes. Notice this word, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left. Like the water as it's coming up, like we need right now, we need a bunch of water. But when the water is roaring down that river and all of a sudden it crests the riverbank, he is telling you that it's getting ready to break forth on the right hand and on the left. It's getting ready to break forth everywhere. I'm not trying to preach to you some prosperity gospel. I'm preaching the gospel. I'm not trying to preach money in your wallet. I'm trying to preach more Holy Ghost in your soul. He said that he would heal your body. And if you're sick, I'm trying to preach to you that there's a God that's a healer. Enlarge your tents. Make ready for it. And my seed shall inherit the Gentiles and make the desolate cities to be inhabited. Fear not. I love that. I love that. Whenever he says fear not, there is going, he is promising you something that is not obvious. Are you with me? He's not promising you something that's easy. He's promising something that is hard for you to figure it out. He's not promising you the obvious. He's promising you a paradox. Fear not. For thou shalt not be ashamed. You shall not be embarrassed. Neither be thou confounded. For thou shalt not be put to shame. For thou shalt forget thy shame of thy youth. There's a lot of you that have in your life, there's a lot of things in your youth that you're ashamed about. Hello, rest of the angels shake your wings off. I know that you ain't got real wings here tonight. All these humans sitting down here, go ahead and shake them off. I know that you're humans here tonight. Neither be thou confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame, for thou shalt forget the shame of thy youth. What a word. And shall not remember the approach of thy widowhood. This is why you can rejoice and this is why you can sing right here. For thy maker is thine husband. He is your head. The Lord of hosts is the name and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth, shall he be called. For the Lord hath called thee as a woman forsaken. Grieved in spirit and a wife of youth when thou wast refused, when you was put away, when nobody else wanted you, when everybody counted you out, when you was refused, I called you. Woo, hallelujah. I've called you as a woman that was forsaken, a woman that was refused. The church world don't want none of these Acts 238 screaming, blabbering, hollering. But that's the only kind that the Word can produce. The world don't want it. Oh, the world don't want it. But God is exactly, you're exactly what God produced in this hour. For a small moment have I forsaken you, but with great mercies will I gather thee. Ooh, what a promise. He is saying to you, 
that your future will be greater than your past. Let that soak in. Your future as a child of God is going to be greater than your past. The devil don't like no praising God around here. Your future will be greater than your past. Say it till you believe it. All the circumstances of the shame of your early history will be forgotten. When you were locked up in Egypt, when you were down there in bondage, he's telling them, when you were dealing with trials, dealing with calamities, sounds like a bunch of you tonight. When you were down there locked up in Egypt, locked up in the world, locked up with trials, locked up with calamities, when it didn't seem like anything was taking place, he said, I've not forsaken you. I've not forgotten you, but your past is forgotten. Your past is not forgotten. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed. I want you to say these words with me. I'm replacing fear with faith. And I'm replacing shame with confidence. I'm replacing fear with faith and I'm replacing shame with confidence. I'm replacing fear with faith and I'm replacing, I'm replacing shame with confidence. I want you to put it on your bedpost. I want you to put it on your fridge with every other picture on there. I'm replacing fear with faith and shame with confidence. Put it on your bedpost. Put it on your light switch. Put it on your door. Put it on your uh, steering wheel of your car. Put it on your desk at work. Put it everywhere. I'm replacing fear with faith. Fear, I am not bound by you no longer. Shame, you have been replaced with confidence. Read it when you wake up. Read it when you go to bed. I'm replacing fear with faith and shame with confidence. Verse 8, in a little wrath I hid my face from thee. From thee for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee, saith the Lord thy Redeemer. For this is as the waters of Noah unto me. For as I have sworn that the waters of Noah shall no more go over the earth, so have I sworn that I would not be wroth with thee, nor rebuke thee. For the mountains shall depart, and thy hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, saith the Lord, that hath mercy on thee. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest and not comforted, behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors and lay thy foundations with sapphires. I will make thy windows of a gates and thy gates of concubine or carbuncles, excuse me, and all thy borders of pleasant stones and all the children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace of thy children. Mamas, write that scripture down. All thy children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace of thy children. In righteousness shall thou be established Thou shalt be far from oppression, for thou shalt not fear. And from terror, for it shall not come near thee. Behold, they shall gather together, but not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Remember, this is the God that told you that joy is returning. Remember, this is a God that is telling you to not be ashamed. This is, tell, this is a God that is telling you to not be confounded. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire. It don't look like joy is coming through the fire, but you remember that God is a God that created the devil that seems like he's roaring on your case. I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, that bringeth forth an instrument for this work. I have created the waster to destroy. 
Joy is returning. And you will not be ashamed. Joy is returning and you will not be ashamed. The God that said that says this. No weapon. The God that says you got something to sing about. Oh, thee that are barren and it don't look like you're going to bring forth. But I want you to sing. Come on, somebody. It may not look like it's coming, but I want you to sing. For no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Fear is trying to stand in the way of my joy. No weapon. Fear is trying to stop, trying to stop joy from coming in my door. No weapon. Sickness is trying to rob me of my peace. No weapon. Diseases keep coming. No weapon. Husbands, when you walk into your house and your wife is over in the closet doing the laundry and she's singing, know she's got something to sing about. Wives, when you see your husband over there cleaning his gun, and he's singing. No, he's got something to sing about. Children, when you see your mama and daddy singing for joy, know that they got something to sing about. Because they're making ready for the joy that's coming back to their house. They're enlarging their tents and they're driving down the stakes. They're making ready for it. When the world tells me that I need to be ashamed of this gospel that I preach, I say I never could be ashamed of this gospel. When the world tells me that I should no longer proclaim the name Jesus, that I should no longer baptize in the name of Jesus, When they tell me I need to be ashamed of this message that I preach. How could I? How could I ever be ashamed of this gospel? How could I ever be ashamed of the God that went to a garden and cried. And wept and battered it out in the garden and said not my will but thy will be done. How could I be ashamed of that? When the world tells me I need to be ashamed of that old rugged cross, it's despised by the world, but how could I be ashamed of the God that carried that cross for me up Galgotha's hill? Tell me, church, how could I rightfully, being a, say, being a sinner saved by grace, be ashamed of the God that saved my soul? How could I be ashamed of this message? When it is the power of salvation, the power of deliverance, the power of grace. How can I be ashamed of this pillar of fire? The Mohammedans have a right to be ashamed in their religion because there's no resurrection there. The Buddhists have every right to be ashamed of their religion because there's no resurrection there. The agnostics, the atheists, they've got every right to be ashamed of themselves for believing that there is no God. But we as Christians should never be ashamed of this gospel for there is resurrection power in this message, in this gospel. It set my soul afly. Stand with me this evening. I 
I'd say, I'd say that if you would ask my mom, ask my dad, I'd say that they would probably be pretty honest with you and tell you that there's some things that I did in my own past that they would say that they're ashamed about that I did or embarrassed that I did. But TJ, we did a couple things that were I'm pretty embarrassed about. I'm embarrassed about saying I had to go diving in dumpster for chips one time. But it's a type to me about a God that lifted me up out of the trash can of sin. I'm embarrassed of certain things in my past, but I'm not ashamed about the God, this hand that was strong enough to pick me up. How could I be ashamed? How about a God that would tell you that joy is returning? I'd be ashamed if that was my word. And tell you, I don't know if joy is coming, but I, I tell you, joy may come. I'd be ashamed if that was my word, but it ain't my word. This is his word. And he said, joy is returning. You've been going through some trials. You've been going through some things that make you reluctant to praise Him. Maybe you cried yourself to sleep. But the Scripture says, Weeping may endure, but joy is coming in the morning. Amen. Weeping may. It might happen, but joy is coming. Amen. You may have some times when you're crying, but know that joy is coming. More than weeping, joy is coming. More than crying, more than being in anguish, joy is coming. Joy is coming in the morning. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Put me somewhere I need to be. For this joy that I have, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Oh, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. Oh, this joy that I have. Oh. This joy that I have.
from the devil. It didn't come from the ends of hell. It came from God. This joy that I have in my soul that keeps bubbling up every morning, every day, the world didn't give it to me. And I know for sure that the world can't take it away. Sickness didn't give me this joy. Surely sickness can't take it away. Come on, somebody. The afflictions that I've been through, they didn't give me this joy. So the afflictions can't take it away. But the God that gave me this joy is here to stay. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. I'm not ashamed of this gospel and I'm not ashamed of the Holy Ghost that comes day in and day out. Woo. This joy that I have. This joy that I have. What well, about you? I want you to make a proclamation from your lips to your neighbor and say, this joy that I have. This joy that I have. This joy that I have. The world didn't give it. The world didn't give it. And the world can't take it away. I didn't get this joy at the end of a bottle. I got this joy at the end of a bottle. I didn't get this joy at some sports game. I didn't get this joy from ESPN. I didn't get this joy from Fox News or CNN or ABC or NBC. I got this joy from the KGV. This joy that I have came from Papa God. Hallelujah. Let's sing it one more time tonight. You believe that tonight? You believe that tonight? This is what I want you to do tonight. This may be unorthodox, but this is what I want you to do tonight. When you get home, I want you to open the door. Open the door. I said, come on in. Joy, come on in. Come on in. Come on in. I'm letting joy in. I'm kicking doubt out. Open the door. I want... I'm expecting some of you that's got cell phones and video everything. I want some videos at the end of this service. When you get home, I want some videos. Somebody open the door. Said, I ain't had joy here for a long time. But joy is coming in with me tonight. I heard a preacher say that joy is returning to the household. Joy is coming back. Joy, come on in. Come on in. I welcome you in here, Joy. I'm going to be happy. This joy that I have, oh, the world didn't give it to me. Well, the world didn't give it, the world can't take it away. Come on in. Say 
take it away. God bless you. Go and receive your joy in the name of